Utah is known for many things, but it seems it's also one of the more scary states out there in the Midwest. Welcome back to the swamp, my friends, and welcome if you're new. It's good to see you made it back for another episode. We are once again going to be sharing some allegedly true, scary stories from a state. This state today is Utah. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit your story at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that truly help keep this show going on a daily basis. Now, sit back, relax, and get ready for these allegedly true and downright creepy horror stories from the state of Utah. It was the summer of 2007, and my best friend and his girlfriend suggested I get a date, and we go to some local hot spots, which are natural hot springs, located deep in a nearby canyon, not too far from where we lived in Utah. Supposedly, these hot spots were excellent, super quick, and easy to get to. Just a short hike from where you would park your car off the main road, running through the canyon. So, it must have been around 7pm that day when we parked the truck in a Spanish Fork Canyon and set off on the trail that led to the natural hot springs, armed with only our swimming suits and towels. I don't know where my friend got his lousy information. It wasn't a quick and easy hike, that's for sure. More like a challenging hike that took over an hour on a very narrow path, where we had to walk single file the entire time, and occasionally over some treacherous spots, where one lousy step would send you cascading down the mountain. It seemed like it would never end, and we'd never get to those hot springs. But after wearing ourselves out and not being adequately prepared, we finally made it. The sun was setting as we finally reached the clearing where somebody dug up the natural pools. It was later than expected, but we figured it would be fun to soak in hot water underneath the stars. We were so deep in the canyon at this point that the stars in the sky were brighter than any other time I've seen them in my life. No light pollution at all. We had probably been there for about 30 minutes and had the entire area to ourselves, just having a great time telling jokes and making each other laugh. The only light was from the stars, and the only sounds were from us. The quiet was almost eerie. Suddenly, we started to hear twigs snapping in every direction. See. There was only one way in and out of the hot springs, though. That super narrow trail that we hiked in on. And that's where we were now hearing the loudest of the noise coming from. Soon, we could make out the outline of a figure in the dark. Someone with a flashlight coming down the trailhead to the collections we were swimming in. I was in a great mood up until this point. Since this person's arrival had surprised us, I yelled out to them once I was confident that they would be able to hear me, to try and break the ice. I didn't want it to be awkward, and partly as a defense mechanism from the nervousness I was feeling suddenly. Hey, you here to join the party? Silence. The person keeps walking towards us and doesn't say a word. Immediately, alarm bells are going off in my head. My gut is telling me that something is not right here. I try to ignore how I'm feeling and joke to our group about the person being a weirdo for not answering. But now everyone is on edge. As the person gets closer we can start to make out more details of this guy. It's a man, above average size, dressed head to toe in black. This guy was wearing a hoodie and long pants in the middle of summer in Utah. Who does that? We noticed he's also wearing a black backpack before he gets to the clearing and turns off his flashlight. He continues walking towards us though. Now, there are a half dozen hot spots scattered around this clearing there is no one else around except us. He has his pick of any of them to swim in. But no, he walked directly towards ours and sits down about six feet away from us while we were soaking. My friend has a lantern, so he hops up to the side of the pool and grabs it and turns it on. Something strange is that it seemed like the stranger was doing something weird before we turned on the lantern. He was ruffling through his bag, looking for something. One of us says something to him and once again we get no response. My friend temporarily turns off the lantern, I assume because it's on low battery, and he doesn't want to wear it out. But once the light is out, the stranger in black unzips his backpack again and starts frantically looking through it. 
My friend immediately turns the lantern back on. The stranger quickly stops, zips the bag back up, and is acting like nothing is happening. My friend notices the stranger appears to be Hispanic, and she greets him in Spanish, which catches the stranger off guard, and he mumbles a response. My friend asks how he is doing, and what he is up to tonight. Did he come for a swim? At least that's what I assume from his tone. I don't speak Spanish very well, so I don't know exactly what the stranger's responses were, but they were very brief and not very friendly sounding. After asking a few more questions to the guy, my friend turns to me and our dates in the pool and says very quietly, but deadly seriously, we need to go right now. Immediately we start getting out of the pool and drying off with our towels. The stranger asks my friend a question in Spanish, something like, oh, where are you guys going so quickly? And while I surmise my friend is playing it off very calmly and like it's no big deal, I know he definitely felt differently. Then, again, he turns to us and says, we're getting our things together and putting on our shoes. Maybe not going as fast as we could. We don't have time. Grab your stuff. We're going now. We don't ask questions. We grab our things and start practically running towards the trailhead as a group. As we look back, we see the stranger in black is getting his things together, getting up and starting to follow us. At this point, there is no illusion of what is happening. This guy has bad intentions and is chasing after us on this narrow trail all the way back to our vehicle. We know we have got an hour or more ahead of us until we are back to the safety of our car, and we don't have anything to defend ourselves with at all. We're still soaking wet. We've got a head start on him, which is a big help. I took the lantern and took the lead of the group. We got into a single file line and locked hands with each other knowing that we would need it to keep moving as fast as we possibly could, but not too quickly, or we could fall to our deaths. The girls were behind me, with my friend at the back, who was giving us updates of where the stranger in black was doing, and telling us to move faster. He picked up the most prominent, the sharpest rock he could find, and prepared to kill this guy if he had to. I'm sure you can imagine the emotions that were running through all of us at the time, Obviously, nobody wanted to hurt anybody. The girls were sobbing, trying to keep pace with me up front. I'm yelling back, watch out for this, watch out for that, and we're making our way into the darkness as fast as we can. I'm telling myself to stay calm, so I don't scare the girls any more than they already are. While I'm also feeling an overwhelming sense of dread that I don't really know how to handle. I don't want to die this young. I'm only 19 years old. After what feels like an eternity, we finally see the main canyon road in our truck. We all run towards it as my friend unlocks it. We all get inside and we're all in shock at this point, and just start shaking uncontrollably. I tell my friend to start the car and start driving so we can get the hell out of here, and never come back. I ask my friend, the one who is speaking Spanish to the stranger, why did you tell us to get out of there so quickly? My friend answered that he purposely had been turning the lantern on and off because he noticed, when he did, the stranger was searching in his bag for something. And when it came back on, the stranger closed it up fast and acted like he hadn't been looking for something. That was when he tried speaking in Spanish to get a feel for what was going on with the guy. My friend said that he was asking the stranger some questions in Spanish like, Where are your friends? And the stranger answered, No friends. And other short answers to basic questions that gave my friend the absolute creeps. Once the stranger asked my friend something about the girls who were with us, that was when he told us we need to get out of there. He was able to see the stranger following us almost the entire time but dropped off towards the end when he couldn't keep pace with us. So, what was the stranger doing in the middle of the dark canyon by himself, dressed in all black? What did he have in his bag that he was trying to get to, that he didn't want us to see? And what would have happened to us if he had caught up to our group on the trail that night? I'd hate to find out. I live in Utah, more northern, not Navajo Nation, but I'm only about three hours away from Skimwalker Ranch to reference how close I am to Skimwalker territory. I live in a neighborhood not too secluded, but it's on the very top of a mountain. Surrounding my community is just mountains and nothing else really. So basically, just a community carved into the hill. Only clearings where houses and yards are, and very wooded. Anyway, I'm not scared of the forest or mountains. I don't really mind being alone. The only thing that worries me is other humans, honestly, and sometimes cougars, as I'm a young girl. I've slept in the mountains a lot with only my dad's dog or my friend. Sometimes, the dark spooks me, but not the dark forest or anything like that. 
I'm pagan, and real big into spirituality and connection with nature and the earth. So for the most part, I find comfort exclusively when I'm outdoors. So when I feel uneasy or afraid when I'm in nature, I always feel like it's for good reason. I never try to ignore it. I used to get home from work late, usually around 10.30 at night. Once I came upon the mountain, this whole drive home, I just felt uneasy, and I was dreading getting out of my car and walking into my house. I fear skimwalkers and entities alike, and I know that attracts them, so I always do my best to try and shake those thoughts as soon as they enter my head, but they always do. That night was no different, but I felt like my fear was for a reason. I didn't want to be outside for a second longer, so I just got out of my car and ran to my back door. I was so nervous. It was that horrible feeling you get when there's something terrible about to happen, as if something was staring at you intently. Nothing happened, luckily. I locked my doors and went to sleep. The night was typical. However, in the morning, I went outside and there was bone fragments all outside of my porch. Not saying it was human, but probably animal of some sort. It looked like it came from a large bone, but again, it just could be pieces of deer or something. I know I live near coyotes and predators, and there's probably a logical explanation for this, but the bone was dry and it looked like it had been mashed up and broken by hand. There's honestly no real way that they could be there. There was no meat, no blood, and this definitely wasn't there the day before. But the bone was dry, not previously removed from something. It was just so strange that it showed up overnight, and it wasn't there the day before, you know? I don't have a dog at this house, just the odd feeling that night before and then the bone. Pretty creepy. I know this might not be the scariest story ever, but I wanted to see if it would fit one of your topics. This is only the second time I have written to you so I am sorry if it doesn't sound like a professional story. Still, it is entirely true. First, a little background information. At the time, I worked at a fast food place in Utah. To keep the identity of my past co-workers, I will not be any more specific than that. However, I remember that my co-worker told me about a story when I first found out that the place was haunted. She told me she had to go to the restroom one day. Now. The doors on the restrooms were the ones that closed loud and closed on their own. She told me that the lights had just turned off, no bang from the door closing, which freaked her out. She later asked my other co-workers if they were trying to prank her. They told her they were all doing their work and didn't have time to do that. Other odd things at the location I worked at happened quite often. Things like hearing footsteps in the lobby long after closing, signs and TVs turning off and on randomly. People were pretty sure they had already turned them off, but randomly, they would be back on, and vice versa. Now, this is where I came in. It was me, my manager, and another one of my co-workers. We were working a closing shift one night, so it was around midnight after we were done with all the cleaning, stocking, and such. My co-worker had finished his paperwork, and I had filled my water bottle, and we had turned out the lights, and then I had realized that I had almost forgotten my bag. No one except the owner can be in the store alone so my manager had to come grab my bag with me. After I had gotten my bag, I looked at him, and he looked pale and afraid. I asked him what was wrong, and he just replied, We are getting out of here now. After we had gotten outside, I asked again what had happened. This time, I got an answer. He had seen a humanoid shadow by the soda storage. Now keep in mind, all the lights were off, and there was no way a shadow could be cast out there. This story has creeped me out for so long, and I thought that sharing it would help me calm down about it. I know, I know, it's not the most scary story you've ever been sent, but I do hope that you share it, and I really hope somebody listening might have a similar experience to make me feel a little less crazy. I've listened to your stories, but I've never posted or had an account to send in. I'm going to give you some background here, so here goes nothing. I lived in Utah for most of my life other than a few years in Wyoming. I'm an Uber Eats driver in Utah and have been for a couple years now. What I'm about to tell you took place about five days ago. I had just finished with a shift of delivering food. It was on the phone with my mother when I got the bright idea to go looking for a former apartment we lived in when I was younger. 
Typically, I carry my new 9mm on me, but that was at home, so I decided to go home and pick it up so that I had some defense if I got into a bad situation. My mom had gone and done some research on the address of the apartment. The apartment used to be called Midtown Villa and was never full of gang activity when I was younger. So I had typed the address into Google Maps and drove out there. I pulled in and realized that the apartment is now called the Calaveras, and everything was now looking better than it used to. So I let my guard down, which looking back on, I now regret. I started pulling through the apartments with my mom on the phone, which we had then agreed that I could pit her on video chat so that she could see the new upgrades. I had pulled back through the entrance off the main road and started showing my mother the building that used to be our apartment building, and I was pointing out that the facility had an empty lot next to it now. The empty lot used to be a playground when I was a kid. The first mistake I made was using a phone to show my mother, which made it look like I was recording. The second mistake, I was pointing. The third mistake, I was in a bad area and I let my guard down. Now. Why did I tell you those mistakes? Because I didn't realize that while I was showing my mother, I was passing a guy and a girl and pointing. Now I know, all that alone doesn't seem too bad, but apparently, I made someone angry who thought I was recording them. Even though I had my 9mm with my loaded magazine, I had made some odd choices since I am a straightforward person. As I continue forward, I realize that I am being chased by the guy who is now on foot after me. He is yelling calling me out and asking if I wanted to wrestle, all while running towards me and taking photos of my car. Before I realized it, I was suddenly moving forward faster in my car. My mind was made up. I was getting out of there and driving off. My adrenaline was pumping, and instead of harnessing it, I mistakenly let it control my actions. With my mom still on video chat, I suddenly noticed a car pulling up fast behind me. I took off out of there, and the vehicle was behind me. I turned right, they turned right. The same turn I made again, they followed. So I went up to 9000 South, took a right after stopping and thinking I was being paranoid. Nope, they followed me to 1300 West. That's where I turned right again, and guess who followed? Now I'm not gonna lie, I was very nervous with multiple scenarios playing out in my head. I knew that I was in a bad situation. I knew that if it came down to it, I had my pistol. I know what you are all thinking, dial 911. Well, I'm the type of person who rarely does that and I wanted to get out of this on my own. While these scenarios crossed my mind, I suddenly got the bright idea to turn right on the 7800 South. So, I did. And then they did. But this time, a semi had gotten between us, right behind me. I was happy until the semi had turned left, and then I knew I had to figure out what to do next. My next decision was to also to turn left, and I approached the next light in the left turn lane to get on the road that leads to 7200 South where the I-15 on-ramp was. What I didn't think about was that what would happen if they followed me. What will happen next will make you reconsider not asking for help when you need it like me. So I turned left. They followed and sped up on my right in that lane. So I immediately swerved over after turning my signal on and getting in front of them. Because let's face it, if they get next to me, it could be game over. So I slowed down a little, and then they got in the left lane and sped up to me. So I sped up as we hit 90 miles per hour, I slammed on my brakes and they slammed on theirs and turned right. If I had been there, I could have been hit and rolled my car and even died. At the very least, I would be in the hospital. That's when they took off down the road on their right, and I booked it to the interstate, drove to a grocery store near my house, and called the police near the apartment complex to report it. The dispatcher then informed me that I should have called 911 to make the situation easier and they could have directed me to the nearest police station with officers outside to deal with anything that followed. The officer then called me and we talked about it. He had gone on to tell me that the area was a very problematic area with gang activity and he believes that my extreme concern and judgment were very accurate. So I made the report just so nobody else could and I didn't have anybody knocking on my door later. So I then headed home and did not let my guard down until I got home and knew I was safe. I told my fiance about it the very next day and she told me never to deliver to that area without some form of protection. So, in closing, don't ever leave yourself without protection. Always ask for help when you need it, because otherwise your life could be at stake, and don't be naive to your situation. I hope this doesn't happen to anyone else, and I hope it can help anybody.
I have a sleep disorder. It means, under stress, I simply don't sleep. I've been awake for up to eight weeks at a time. There was a film called The Machinist about someone with my disorder. However, in the film, the guy went on to work every day and seemed to function okay at work. It is impossible to have normal function when you have been awake for a month or so. Unless, of course, you're on meth. And I have never tried meth. Never will. When I've been awake for a month, it feels like hell on earth. I feel as tired as a person would be who has not slept for a month. But still unable to get sleep, I've taken 40 sleeping pills over the counter at one time, topped off with 4 bottles of NyQuil, topped off by 20 melatonin, and the result, not even sleepy. Not in the least. Just a super bad headache. My condition is truly horrible. Anyway, most of you will conclude, Ah, well, we know why you see a ghost. You're hallucinating for lack of sleep. That could be true. However, there is another theory. The other theory is that ghosts are real and can be seen by those who are in the proper brainwave. The brainwave of a sleeping person is different from that of a fully awake person, and the brainwave of a fully awake person is different from that of a person who just wakes up. Well, I've seen ghosts and shadow people in all states of wakefulness. Just waking up and other times having been awake for eight hours after a restful sleep. Most people dream about holding a good job, retiring, and buying a house, raising children, etc. My dream was to get on SSD, which is disability, and get maybe $700 a month, that's all they can give you, and get some food stamps. Then find an abandoned house somewhere away from a city. I would make sure it was abandoned. Then I would clean it the best I could and then put all sorts of blankets in it and get about 100 gallons of water to store inside. Then I'd buy several hundred pounds of beef jerky and other things like energy bars and food items that keep for a long time just so I don't have to ever see people. I assumed the house would have no electricity depending on where it was. I might have to get a metal container or fill it with a bunch of coal or something like that. Intruders? I'd have to buy a lot of mouse traps and things of that sort. Some sort of ingenious alarm system that would wake me up if people came into the structure. I would need something to discourage people, like a sign that said danger, closed by the county health department, infectious contagions inside, something like that. And then once I had all the blankets and mouse traps and the signs up and the other warning systems, and a large metal barrel and the coal and the 10 gallon water jugs, enough to last for a while, and the 300 pounds of beef jerky and 200 pounds of energy bars, I'd move in and just sleep. Sleep for as long as possible. To me, that sounds like heaven. That is my idea of heaven and earth to just sleep. Anyway, back in 2004, I was living in Kaysville, Utah, in an old motel. For some reason, about 3 a.m., I just opened my eyes, and I saw what looked to be a shadow woman floating over me through the front door, and she was on her way to the bathroom. Completely black, no features, but I could tell she was a woman and had a large beehive-like hairdo. The ones that were like popular in the 1960s and high cheekbones. She was headed for the bathroom, the only room in the motel room with a mirror. I looked at her, and then she turned her head to look at me. It scared me to death, so I quickly closed my eyes, and I regret that now. Now, I would wave at her to investigate more, but back then I was just so scared. I remember thinking later, I guess there are bobby pins in the spirit world. How else would she have her beehive? I guess there's clothing too. Anyway. Another missed opportunity to try to make some interdimensional contact. I've seen ghosts and shadow people many times. These could be merely hallucinations produced by my own mind and sleep disorder. Or, my brain could have some unique chemistry that allows me to see things most people cannot see. I'd love to see the conversation on this topic in the comments down below. Hello, I am a manager for one of the most haunted locations in the state of Utah. You probably have seen us on shows like Ghost Adventures, which have been here twice. A few others have done some episodes, and sorry to spoil the magic, but those are mostly fake or exaggerated. The only reason I'm mentioning this part is to hopefully give some form of credibility. The point is, while I do believe, I don't just believe everything I hear and read. I ghost hunt up here a lot. And, not like YouTube teenager breaking into abandoned buildings and walking around, more like real professional investigations with other professionals. The location, paranormal-wise, if you name it, we have it, 
Shadow people, residual hauntings, intelligent haunting, poltergeist, phantom animals, shapeless masses of shadows, and energy, hellhounds, you name it, it's probably been seen here. One entity has piqued my interest as of late though. It's typically seen in the basement. However, as of the last few months, it seems to have started venturing out. Usually, we don't allow ghost hunters into the basement for safety concerns. Here's a description of this entity. It is described as a pale, thin humanoid figure. It crawls on all fours. It appears to be completely hairless and wears no clothes. Now, I know what you're thinking, and yes, this is real and not a reference to the rake or any other creepypasta stories. However, it is similar in appearance. The few times it was seen in the basement, it sat and watched what we were doing, seemingly curious. However, last month, however, roughly about a month ago, a very good friend of mine who has very high credibility in my book saw this thing materialize out of the floor on the ground level. It then charged at her and ran up behind the wall before disappearing. Last week, a demonologist came and did an overnight public ghost hunt. At about 2.40 a.m., he came running back to the base camp room and wouldn't go investigate anymore. He was in the same room that it was seen last month. Yesterday, while working in that room, my shoulder started to burn. When I checked later, I noticed a series of scratches on my left shoulder. I just want to know what this thing is, and the people I usually ask this are just as confused as I am. I hope somebody listening can give me some information in the comments down below, and thank you for sharing my story. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true horror stories from Utah. As always, if you enjoyed these stories, please be sure to hit that like button as it helps me out a ton. The more likes this episode gets, the more YouTube promotes it, and that is incredibly helpful to the swamp. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts or another podcast platform, please be sure to give this a 5-star rating over there, as it's incredibly helpful to growing there for us. If you're new to the swamp, why not join us? Hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications to never miss a new episode as I upload them nearly every single day and all things natural and supernatural. If you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd be honored to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. It's stories like yours that help keep this show going on a daily basis. If you're on the go but don't have YouTube Premium, but still want to listen to your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories no matter where you are, you can download them absolutely free from Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, and pretty much anywhere else you find podcasts online. If you would like to support the Swamp outside of hitting that like button, subscribing, and maybe giving us a 5-star rating on Apple Podcasts, be sure to check out the merch store. We've got t-shirts, hoodies, face masks, and more. I'd love to see you guys wearing some cool Swamp threads. I'd love to know in the comments down below what story tonight was your favorite. There were a lot of very odd ones tonight, and I don't really know if I could pick one myself. Be sure to join me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and I'll see you all soon with another creepy video.